I was born in Turkey in the 1980s to a Turkish father and a British mother. Although Turkey has been a secular country since the 1920s, the influence of the Ottoman Empire can be felt everywhere. The population is largely Muslim, and while I wasn't raised in religion, I felt its presence every day. I've always felt comfort in the idea of a creator and the idea of another life after this one. I've never really considered the idea of there being nothing. It seems almost ridiculous to think that we just appeared on this tiny planet without explanation. And when we die, we just disappear without a trace. I believe that spirits and ghosts are just a form of energy that we don't yet understand and it's only a matter of time before we discover the true nature of this phenomena. Evidence of the paranormal is notoriously hard to come by, but perhaps people have been looking in the wrong places. All it would take is one cast iron piece of proof to change everything. From an early age, as young as I can remember, I was terrified of the devil. This fear stayed with me into adulthood, but work and everyday life intervened and I gave it less and less thought. It was only when I came to question my faith that I started to think about it again. In my 30s, over a period of about 18 months, I went from being an Anglican Christian to an agnostic and finally a fully-fledged atheist. It was almost sad to lose the sense of belonging and more importantly, the promise of something after this life. But for me, it just rang true. One upside of this change was that even though I'd lost the comfort of a god, I'd also lost any fear of the devil. Even though I'm utterly convinced by atheism, there's still so much that science struggles to explain. I don't believe in spirits, ghosts or demons. I think they're nothing more than inventions of our collective imagination. As a believer, and a non-believer, we've decided to look into as many facets of the supernatural as we can. I want to be challenged and have my take on the paranormal question. I want to show that supernatural phenomena are just aspects of our universe that we simply don't fully understand yet. We'll speak to experts in the field on both sides of the argument. Psychics, skeptics, demon hunters, and academics to see if we can finally discern if there really is something on the other side.
When we first started thinking about this, it became clear that it would be impossible to cover everything. The supernatural is a virtually limitless subject, so we needed to think about what to focus on. We decided to begin with an ancient phenomena that has gained increasing momentum in recent years. Exorcism is a religious practice where an evil spirit or demon is said to be evicted from the body of a person they have physically possessed. It is an ancient ritual shared by many belief systems and cultures around the world. This procedure is normally carried out by a priest or spiritual figure and usually involves specific verses calling upon the spirit to leave in the name of a higher power. In Christian exorcisms, these exorcists call upon God, Jesus, the saints, and often various angels to assist them in the expulsion of the demon. Possessed individuals are not considered to be evil themselves, but rather unwilling victims playing host to a malicious entity. These victims aren't considered responsible for their actions, and the exorcism is considered a remedy rather than a personal punishment. The possessed can often display signs of violence and aggression, and are often restrained during the exorcism in an effort to protect both the priest and the possessed. Christian exorcisms had declined greatly in America by the 1800s, and it was only when popular culture began to explore the idea that the rate of exorcisms increased dramatically. Possession, however widespread and established as a phenomenon, is not considered to be a valid condition by the scientific community. Science points to a similarity between the symptoms of possession and symptoms of accepted physical and psychological conditions such as psychosis, epilepsy, Tourette's syndrome and schizophrenia. Despite this skepticism, the phenomenon and the rituals that surround it continue to provoke debate. the Roman Catholic Church before being uh, appointed by an exorcist you need to speak with a priest and then if this priest think that it could be a case there is a proper committee that uh, investigate on your case to recognize if there is any other explanation and for other explanation we are usually thinking about a psychological or even worse a psychiatric uh, condition uh, this committed is made with a priest of course but also with medical doctors and psychiatrists that can understand if there is any other issues no people with medical issues and medical conditions that can be clearly identified by a medical doctor are uh, moved to the exorcists so horrible scary footage of a guy being exercised throwing himself around on a on a bed um, this is that thing of the back arched and, and we took it to um, a doctor who specialized in uh, epilepsy and epileptic fits because we knew this guy had no history of epilepsy and he said it was a, a pseudo epileptic fit there was a whole type of um, fitting that is uh, stress related, normally it's people that have had abuse uh, in their past and it's a cry for help and it's not a fit in the way that an, an epileptic will have a fit, it's not created in the same way, it's, all, it's almost um, doing what you think a fit is. Uh, you could also then see how things like the arching of the back would create a sort of, it looked a bit like you might have levitated, he didn't, he very clearly didn't, but how you might if you believed that and you half remembered what you saw, so you get films like The Exorcist that sort of play on that. There had to be more to this than mental illness or imagined fits. From all sources that we'd spoken to, the general opinion was that nobody from the Roman Catholic Church would speak to us about exorcism. With their ranks closed, we decided to look further afield. We discovered two figures in America at the forefront of modern day exorcism. The first was an ex-New York cop turned demonologist named Ralph Sarchi. His life's work with demons in the church was dramatized in the 2011 film Deliver Us From Evil. 
The second was well-known Pentecostal pastor and exorcist, Robert Larson. He claims to have exorcised thousands of people during his career and has attracted a loyal following and overt criticism in equal measures. We headed for the airport and flew out to New York. Several key supernatural scenes in Deliver Us From Evil are said to have been lifted directly from Saatchi's memoirs, and we were keen to discuss his first-hand experiences with evil. It had taken some months to pin Saatchi down. Despite his brushes with Hollywood and TV shows, he remained notoriously reluctant to give interviews. He was still being evasive, but eventually agreed to meet us in his hometown on Long Island. We left New York behind us, wondering what way to the head. The next day, Saatchi picked us up from our hotel and offered to give us a tour of nearby Amityville, scene of the infamous Amityville horror story and grisly the Feo murders. He talked about his work with the famous supernatural investigators, the Warrens, and some of the cases they'd worked on. Saatchi had picked a large park for the interview, and we made our way there to begin. Well, I, I grew up in Queens, Flushing, Queens. Uh, I went to parochial school, Catholic school, uh, up to eighth grade. I was an altar boy. Uh, so that, that's about as religious as I was. And when I got involved in the work, I never had any kind of experience growing up as far as seeing a, a manifestation of any kind of a spirit. I never had any, uh, any preternatural activity or activity outside the natural order that God instituted, or I didn't recognize it if I did. It wasn't until I got involved with, actually, Ed and Lorraine Warren, I, I became one of their investigators in, in the early 90s, uh, working with them. Uh, and I worked with Bishop McKenna uh, through the Warrens. Uh, Father Martin was, was another one that I, that I uh, met being involved in this work. So it seemed like all the right people were put in my path to, uh, to lead me to where I needed to go. Uh, you know, I think that uh, being a, a New York City police officer, uh, I got the trust from the Warrens and, and Bishop McKenna right away, and Father Martin for that, for that matter. Their, their whole life serves God. There's nothing else, you know, and, and you got to be around people like that because you learn the most from people like that. And if you want to know about the devil, you got to know who God is. We're dealing with different types of uh, spirits that have different powers. The demons come from the nine choirs of angels, actually, and, you know, they, they have different powers. The choir of angels is the lowest choir, so I'm, I'm assuming that that's what we mostly deal with. But every once in a while, we get something that we know is not quite right. We're dealing with a devil, and we're not dealing with a demon, you know, and they're, and they're powerful. When I'm in a house or, or during, it doesn't happen really during solemn exorcisms, it happens during homes. I get, I get a sharp pain in, in the right side of my head. It could either be here, it could be here. It's predominantly here. And it's not a headache, it's, it's almost like, if I could relate, it's not as, um, not as profound, but maybe somebody put, like maybe an ice pick. It's centralized, it's, it's very focused, it's a very focused pain. It's different from, you know, like a, a, a headache type of thing. Not every one of my cases that comes to me is a genuine case of diabolical activity. I deal with a lot of mentally ill people. They need to be helped. You know, we will not lead a person down a path to believe that they have a problem with the demonic if they don't. I've assisted at about 27, around that number. It wasn't much from the time that I wrote the book uh, as far as dealing with genuine cases of possession. The number could be even more than that. They did a study. I believe they used about 800 cases 
of demonic, pose uh, demonic possession and, and oppressions. And they look for a common denominator between all of those people, or a pattern at least, or a majority, and they couldn't find not one connection. There is no cultural, there is no religion, there is no color of skin, there is no anything. We're, we're the subject of a battle that we can't see. We're the subject of a battle that makes ISIS look like Girl Scouts. Every single person that's been born, every single person that's alive right now, there are two beings that have their complete and total attention. One is God and one is the devil. They're both looking at every single one of us and they're both fighting for us. And, but we're the ones that have the say in it. Neither one of them do. It's down to us. It's either you choose to go with God or you choose to go with the devil. And if you don't go with God, you've already, you've automatically gone with the devil. The end game of dark forces is to take as many souls away from God as possible. That's the end game. That's the goal. After the interview, with some persuasion, Saatchi agreed to show us some videos of exorcisms he had attended over the years, but made it clear we would not be able to use or reproduce these videos in any way. He arrived at our hotel room with a laptop and a large number of DVDs. He showed us several sessions, and while each one was disturbing in its own way, most could be explained away by various conditions and medical possibilities. That was, however, until we reached the last video. The subject of the video was a thin adult male being restrained by other men. As he struggled, he began to drool. As his drool hit his white shirt, it appeared to turn bright red, resembling blood. He continued to struggle and groan, as if in terrible pain. All at once, he stopped struggling. He blinked in a very exaggerated manner three times, and then his eyes stayed open without blinking at all for the remainder of the video. As he stared blankly into the middle distance, the pupils of his eyes appeared to change shape into something very much like a goat's eye. As the video progressed, the man's skin appeared to blister and bubble, and a cut began to open up on his forehead. We both found this video very unsettling, and for the first time in years, I woke up in the middle of the night, full of fear. My previously airtight atheism had taken a hard knock. If what we saw in this video was real, then maybe I was wrong about everything. What stuck out about that last video was the fact it was because of the combination of conditions that the, the guy was exhibiting. You know, if it was just dribbling, you know, the blood, you know, you could say, well, perhaps he bit his cheek and it was just a video that made it look like it was turning to blood. Um, you could say about his eyes, but not blinking. You know, we looked into that and that it is possible to not blink for up to 30 to 40 minutes, we found out. So, the whole the cut opening on his head maybe had high blood pressure and that was an old cut. Who knows? But I think for me, the thing that made it disturbing was it was it was a culmination of about five or six different things that on their own were fairly hard to explain, let alone all happening at once. Our time in Long Island was drawing to an end. We packed the car and headed towards Baltimore to meet with Bob Larson. He was due to carry out some exorcism sessions in a church nearby. We were hoping he would allow us to attend and see for ourselves the work that he was doing. After I became a Christian, my goals, working myself through university with a rock band, 
and being a musician and wanting to go into medicine changed very dramatically. But I wasn't sure what that was. So I went on a motivational speaking tour and did that for several years. What was interesting is that during that time, people would come to me to talk to me about problems and demons would speak out of them. For 20 years, I hosted a nationally syndicated radio show. People would call me and sometimes they would tell me outlandish stories of their worship of the devil and sometimes these people would actually have demonic voices speak through them over the radio. So I, I kept this thing going until about 20 years ago. I felt the call. I have to do this full time. Demonic possession occurs as the result of a variety of reasons, but there are, generally speaking, a handful of more common ways. One, hereditary. You inherit the demons, you're born with them. They're in the bloodline. They are there because of evil of prior generations. Secondly, you do evil. That could be almost anything. It could be the all called her witchcraft, it could be Satanism, or it could be as simple as hating someone and wishing them ill, or getting just enough knowledge of witchcraft spells to be dangerous and try to see if they work. It could be as simple as playing with a Ouija board. But there always has to be an open door. The grace of God protects people, even in our ignorance and innocence, from inhabitation of evil. So the devil knows he has to have an open door, a right, and he's always looking for it. I never used to think much about how many exorcisms I've done until the press started asking me and I had to do some calculating. And I have to keep recalculating because of my busy exorcism schedule, but Sometime this last year, it passed 40,000 documented cases. Reverend Bob agreed to let us attend his exorcism sessions. Before each session, he would gather notes and go over the case with his team. Each session began with a lengthy discussion with each exorcist. He would discuss mental history, spirituality, and family with each of his clients before moving on to the actual exorcism. Every time I do an exorcism, I'm in danger. I'm in spiritual danger. I'm in physical danger. And I have been physically injured. Perhaps the worst was getting my ribs broken one time. Uh, but I've been scratched and gouged and kicked and bloodied and thrown across the room. I've been knocked down. They've attempted to strangle me, but I've survived pretty well. But from a spiritual standpoint, Every demon wishes me ill. I simply have to believe and have confidence that Christ will protect me. If I'm doing his work and I'm doing his calling, it is God's obligation to keep me safe so I can help the people he wants me to help. Go, 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 go in the power of Christ. Go, get out of her, go. Go by the power of Christ. Go. Not push it out of you. Push that evil. Push every <clears throat> thought of death out of you now. Come out. Go. Go. Spirit of death, go. 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 Now, what if you come behind her? Sir. The power of Christ, go. Yeah. Loose her. Go. Go. Yeah. Out. I wish that every exorcism I did was successful. It's not. Sometimes we encounter demons we can't get out. Sometimes I'm absolutely certain a person has demons and I can't get them to speak or display themselves in a way to expel them. Well, ultimately it's not about me. It's God who is doing the exorcising. I'm just an instrument to enforce God's will. So. I have to concede that it may not be God's time yet for that person for some reason, or that individual 
may not be ready to get rid of their demons. I sometimes say people, without realizing it, make friends of their demons. As an exorcist, I spend a lot of time casting out demons, but I also spend at least equal, if not more time, telling people they don't have demons, that they're looking for a magic bullet and a quick fix. They would like to blame their problems on the devil. And even sometimes when people are demonically possessed, not everything they do is demonic. Some of it is just aberrant behavior. It is just plain emotional laziness of not wanting to deal with their problems in a realistic way. But it's pretty clear when it's actually the devil because the person may act in a way that's contrary to their personal desires and wishes. And, and that is when you know it's outright absolute possession. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10, Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's about as good a definition of the devil as you're ever going to get. Steal, kill, and destroy. That's what darkness does. We witnessed three sessions, each more unnerving than the last. The strange fluctuations in the behavior could be interpreted as genuine possession or maybe just the result of hypnotic suggestion. The last subject was a middle-aged woman from Canada who alleged terrible abuse at the hands of a stalker from her hometown. Her story was both distressing and emotionally shattering. But did it amount to genuine possession? That was a good confession for you to make that your emotions are in Christ. My chest. He choked me with lots of head bashing. He broke my teeth. The rest. He tore off my hair. It's just falling. Often people think it must be terribly difficult discerning the difference between a psychological or mental problem and demonic possession actually is very easy. If you understand the various forms of mental illness and how they exhibit themselves and the way that they're expressed through verbalization, generally speaking, a few well-placed questions will tell you. Now in the final session, things were about to take a dramatic turn. I speak the healing of Christ to her fear. Lord, reach inside her and take that unnatural, demonic fear out of her. Yeah! 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 Without any threats. Without any 
to this woman. To this woman. I have to go. I have to go. I'll take my demons. I'll take my demons. Judge my God. To be judged by God. Get out. Ah. Go. Go. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. The devil wants to bring suffering, misery, pain, death, destruction to all humanity in every way that he can. At the end of the session, we offered to give the woman a lift back to her hotel. After such trauma, we expected her to be withdrawn and melancholic. Bizarrely, she was light-hearted and happy. But is this really the result of a demon expulsion or just an indication of a very strange yet effective therapy session? Our stateside journey was over and we headed back to New York. We'd seen some very strange things on our trip but as we got on the plane, I had to wonder if it was actual proof or just a murky sideshow. With Reverend Bob Larson's sessions, I did find them very uh, affecting and quite emotional in a lot of places. I don't know if that adds up to a genuine demonic or supernatural experience for me the the energy in the room created by you know the the, the person who was possessed and also uh bob larson and the people that he had around him kind of created this atmosphere that did feel like it was kind of supernatural and what happened to the people in you know the the possessed people in the sessions was also very strange to witness uh, but I didn't really see anything physically manifest that I couldn't explain away as, you know, somebody being in a trance or being open to suggestion or just simple bizarre but simple role play. Think about the first girl who was exercised. Her mother didn't even tell her that she was coming to an exorcism session. So she came in saw everyone, saw us, did not know what was happening. And even after this, something happened then and there. So whatever happened, something changed that person. Something happened. And with the last exorcism, with that poor woman, who really broke my heart, when she looked at me, I could see it wasn't her. When I say it wasn't her, it wasn't her that I met initially. She wasn't in that same state of mind, whatever you want to call it, but it wasn't right. Back in the UK, we received some very welcome but unexpected news. Hi. Hello, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. What's going on? So, um, do you remember I told you that um, no one from the Roman Catholic Church uh, accepted uh, to speak with us? Yeah. Guess what? Um, 
you sat with somebody? Yeah. So um, I won't give you all the details now, but uh, I've found an exorcist, a Roman Catholic exorcist, who is willing to give us an interview. Amazing. I know. I know. Great news, huh? I'll tell you all about it when you get back, yeah? Once again, we headed back to the airport, bound for Bologna. The priest in question was Father François d'Armin, originally from Canada, but now living in Ancona, Italy. His career in exorcism spanned two decades, and we were eager to talk to him about his life and battles with the dark side. Sono esorcista da praticamente più di 20, da 22 anni per l'esattezza 1944 e ho, quando sono ritornato ho ricominciato a pregare e mentre pregavo però dicevo al Signore tu mi puoi chiedere tutto tranne che diventare sacerdote ecco. e, però lui ha vinto le mie resistenze non ho mai avuto ovviamente ripensamenti mi sono mai rincresciuto di questa mia decisione e sono diventato sacerdote nel 1979 eh, e sono stato ordinato dal Papa Giovanni Paolo II, ecco allora. E le circostanze che mi hanno portato ad accettare la richiesta del Vescovo di diventare esorcista ufficiale della diocesi sono abbastanza per me un, costituiscono un segno della volontà di Dio e di fronte a questo segno io non ho potuto dire di no. Quindi io ho cominciato a fare l'esorcista, il primo, mio primo esorcismo nel 1994 con un caso di possessione. Abitualmente l'esorcista riceve tante persone che subiscono altre forme di attacchi da parte del demonio. O meglio, si dovrebbe precisare che l'esorcista riceve tante persone che pensano di essere disturbate in modo straordinario dal demonio, ma che non lo sono. Queste persone hanno bisogno di essere ascoltate, di essere aiutate, di essere rassicurate e di essere avviate anche in un, corso, in un percorso ecco, cristiano anche di conversione. Per esempio ci sono delle persone che cominciano ad accusare dei dolori molto forti, ecco, che tra l'altro magari cambiano posto. No? E queste persone eh, vanno dal medico, come devono fare, anzi se non ci sono andati siamo noi che li mandiamo dal medico, eh, esorcisti è una delle prime condizioni ecco quando una persona ci racconta queste cose diciamo ma voi siete andati dal medico devo dire che anche qualche medico manda eh, i suoi pazienti in certi casi ecco dall'esorcista con molta discrezione ovviamente ecco. che si presentano dell'esorcista ci sono delle persone che avevano perso la fede o che non erano credenti ma che trovandosi confrontate a fatti inspiegabili ecco, tentano anche la strada del, del, della chiesa e dell'esorcismo eccetera no? e si rivolgono quindi a un esorcista, a un sacerdote. Questo può capitare perché effettivamente queste persone sono confrontate a circostanze che non si spiegano, per esempio nel caso delle vessazioni ci sono delle persone alle quali non va mai nulla bene. Il pismo che non è necessariamente riservato ai casi di possessione, ma può essere anche utilizzato per i casi di gravi ossessioni o vessazioni. Anche la possessione, la possessione ha le sue manifestazioni e i suoi sintomi abitualmente. E generalmente e queste possessioni comportano prima di tutto una avversione al sacro. Le persone entrando in chiesa magari non riescono ad entrare in una chiesa e se entrano in una chiesa 
si sentono molto, molto, molto a disagio e si sentono male, ecco, in chiesa. Un altro sintomo è che molte di queste persone cominciano a fare una cosa che magari non hanno mai fatto in vita loro, cioè bestemmiare, bestemmiano molto, ecco, possono bestemmiare e questo ovviamente per questo si può trovare una spiegazione psicologica, bisogna indagare, cercare di capire, eccetera. Può essere un momento di tensione che attraversa questa persona, di grande stress, ecco, di grande angoscia che si traduce con, eh, attraverso delle bestemmie, praticamente. Comunque ci sono anche queste. Poi ci sono dei, eh, dei, eh, dei fenomeni anche eh, di, di grande forza. Per questo che per certi casi, io l'ultimo molto importante di cui mi sono occupato, eh, avevo bisogno di una decina di persone ecco, per seguire la vittima perché eh, questa persona aveva una forza incredibile e riusciva a eh, svincolarsi anche da chi lo teneva, per cui ci doveva sempre essere qualcun altro vicino per saltargli addosso e riprendersi un braccio che era sfuggito con ecco, la presa degli assistenti. Insomma. Quindi una grande forza. Mi ricordo in particolare un, il caso ecco, di un... Eh, di una persona che, eh, al quale il demonio faceva girare la, eh, la testa in senso anti-orario e qualcuno si è preoccupato ma non si farà male al collo così quando è rientrato in sé questa persona non sentiva assolutamente nulla al collo poi ci sono anche dei fenomeni, eh, altri fenomeni paranormali più, ancora più evidenti, cioè quando la persona comincia sempre in trance con una voce alterata a dire delle cose che non può assolutamente sapere. Poi possono capitare dei fenomeni di materializzazione di oggetti che possono essere di vario tipo e che molto spesso escono fuori dalla bocca della vittima oppure che la vittima trova per, per terra. Invece gli oggetti che si materializzano uscendo dalla bocca ovviamente non vengono dallo stomaco, anche perché talvolta possono vomitare letteralmente dei pezzi di vetro e non potrebbero provenire dallo stomaco. Poi da sacerdote cattolico mi trovo a usare il rituale che è stato pubblicato in Vaticano nel 1998 con delle ulteriori edizioni. Se però è vero che durante gli esorcismi non ho mai eh, subito eh, dei grossi attacchi ecco, da parte del demonio, mi è capitato fuori dall'esorcismo di eh, correre dei, peri un cer dei cer certi pericoli. Posso citarne uno molto preciso. Eh, una volta esorcizzo una persona posseduta che cambiando voce mi dice, eh, perché a questa persona avevo detto, non avrei dovuto dirlo, che dovevo prendere la macchina e andare eh, in una città eh, a Bologna. Ecco. E allora eh, questa persona va in trance durante l'esorcismo e mi dice tu andrai a sbattere, così mi disse. Io non ne ho tenuto conto anche perché sono certo, certo che il demonio fa tante minacce e però non è libero di fare quello che vuole fare. E eh, effettivamente ho preso la macchina e sono andato per andare eh, a Bologna qui e sull'autostrada a un certo momento ho dovuto, dovevo sorpassare dei tir, ecco, ne avevo uno a destra e uno davanti a me. Ecco, eh, ho voluto mettermi sulla terza corsia, ovviamente prima di effettuare il sorpasso. 
ho guardato con molta cautela ecco gli specchietti e non c'era nessuna macchina nella terza corsia per cui ho abbozzato la, il sorpasso ma proprio mentre lo abbozzavo suona il telefonino nella mia macchina ovviamente non lo prendo perché stavo poi guidando e, eh, e abbozzo il sorpasso e proprio in quel momento arriva una macchina a velocità incredibile sulla terza corsia che mi sorpassa e io ho fatto un gesto ma ho, ho sentito letteralmente la mia macchina che come se qualcuno avesse presa e rimessa sulla seconda corsia no? e poi mi sono reso conto che questa telefonata era di quella persona che mi aveva detto che sarei andato a sbattere ma non finisce lì ritorno da questa persona qualche giorno dopo di nuovo durante l'esorcismo va in trance e mi dice allora a te è arrivata la telefonata e come mai non sei andato a sbattere quindi certi pericoli ci sono sì però ripeto io mi sento tranquillo perché anche se prego molto soprattutto, con, soprattutto quando guido ma sono molto tranquillo perché so di essere nelle mani di Dio.